All right. There we go. How's everybody doing? Uh-oh. My noise changed or something. I can't hear you guys. Hello? Can you hear that? There we go. I hear you now. Yeah. Hey, hey. I'm not Patrick. Let me change my name. I'm Drew. Hope everybody's doing all right today. There we go. All righty. So if you guys, if you want to leave your camera off, that's totally fine. You can put notes there in, uh, in the side too. You can type. And uh, yeah, if you got any questions or anything, just let me know. How can I help? Uh, are we starting? Yeah, yeah, totally. What can I help you with? Okay, I'm brand new. I've just assembled my machine. I got a. I have the uh, latest image of Makerverse on a Raspberry Pi. Okay. And for some reason, <laughs> the little window where you're supposed to put in all your calibration information is not there. That's one thing I've got trouble with. The other thing is you have a set home button and you have a go home button for X and Y. When I hit go home, it issues the set home command. It sets my zero. I don't know if you heard me there or not. Um, there you go. Sorry, sorry, Michael. I had to. I had to mute you. Can you say that one more time, Dave? Okay. Um, the uh, you have a, a set home button and a go home button for X and Y. Okay. When I set home, it sets home property. You can see the command sh go by in the monitor window. But when I hit the go home button, it issues the set home command again. So that's on the uh, the build two five seven one one two. And that's Raspberry. with the Raspberry Pi. Yes, sir. So. I have I have not run the Raspberry Pi with the M2, so okay. uh, I haven't done that. So uh, Chris Chris has, and he uses a Raspberry Pi with his M2, but I have not because we because that's that's still like a testing thing for the community to test out and work okay. through on GitHub and stuff like that. So I am not sure um, why it wouldn't be doing that because it should be giving you that command, and I'm not sure of the G code command. Um, and I'm not sure if Chris can join this training today. I sent him a message to see if he might jump on here. Um, let's see. I'm not sure if he, if, he, uh, if he can. But what we can do is if you want to send me an email to support, or I can take your email and, and I can email you, and then I'll get you in touch with, with somebody that can help you with the Raspberry Pi, because I don't know enough about it. There might be somebody here that's used the Raspberry Pi. Um, I think if Drew joins from Can Opener, he might. I think he's used a Raspberry Pi with his. But I haven't done that yet on mine. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry I can't help you with that. So nope. Um, uh, one other thing I'd like to offer to the group is I wired up a set of e-stop switches on my machine, so no more running for the plug. There's just two e-stop palm buttons on either side that I can hit oh, and stop hit? everything. It stops the motors. It stops the router. It stops the suction. So I can provide those wiring diagrams if you guys want them or not. That's up to you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, because I, I mean that's something too that you can that you can set up just to like I have mine set up on a on a power strip that I can like flip on the power strip. So see, but um, but you're also dumping the controller and the computer, aren't you? Uh, no, I'm just so I'm cutting the power to the uh, on this it's it's cutting it to the do board and the router. Uh, so it cuts the powder to all that, and then I can just I can stop it on uh, on the computer itself because it really just needs to stop. The power for the uh, for the motors. So if the Correct. motors aren't powered, then it will stop, and then the router shuts off. And then it, even if the G code is still running a little bit, well then you can stop it on the computer. So you don't have to kill the computer. You just you stop that one. Right. That's exactly what I did. I killed the 12 volts going to the do, which only shuts the motor drivers down because it looks like the Arduino is powered off the USB connection. It is. Yeah. So it will keep its connection on there. So then you can stop it and then you can, you can reset the connection and then you can turn it back on and then you'll be, you'll be rocking and rolling. So, cool. Yeah, sweet. So Dave, do you want to email support or do you want us to email you? I will email you guys. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Yeah. So just support at makermade.com and then just say that you're looking for help with Raspberry Pi and, and I'll get you pointed in the right direction. We'll make sure that we get you going because um, both of those, because it, it is Makerverse that's on there. So for the window that's not popping up, um, if you're connected to it, it sh I don't it, know why that window wouldn't be popping up. I don't um, either. I mean, I, I, my Windows version of it has it. The problem is I don't have a Windows computer. It's in a different building. I don't have a Windows computer out there, and I don't have an extra one I can tie up. That was why I wanted to use the Raspberry Pi. 
Right. Yeah. Um, so for sure. Well, it, if you send that email, like I'll make sure that that we respond to you and we'll get you going. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't help you with it. Nope. That's okay. I'm, I'm sorry to monopolize the uh, meeting. No, no, no. That's exactly what this is for. Like <laughs> it's totally fine. Yeah. For the Raspberry so, Pi, there's also it. a lot of people on uh, the Facebook page, This the M2 users group. Oh, I, I can't hear you very well, Casey. Are you there? Yep. For the Raspberry Pi, can you guys hear me? There you go. Yeah, I hear you now. Okay. For the Raspberry Pi question, there's I see a lot of comments and a lot of discussion posts on the Facebook user group. So you might want to look there as well. Yep, I will look into that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. Yeah, checking out the Facebook group. I mean, there's uh, y'all are awesome in there. I can't even keep up with all the awesome projects and stuff that everybody's working on. So um, yeah, that's a great place to, to go to for sure. Yeah, and in that as well, uh, you had asked if we could if I could do that video that shows how to go from uh, one software SketchUp all the way into Makerverse. Yeah. I posted it in there. I don't know if you guys want to take it and put it on your website or whatever, but it's all oh, posted awesome. in there. Yeah. It's uh, about three or four minutes long, but it kind of describes each step, how to convert the file, then load it into ESOL, then take it from ESOL, convert the G code, then load it into Makerverse, and That's awesome. then you're ready to hit play. So I'll go and check that out. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, I'm not on Facebook every day, so uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll absolutely go. I'm going to write a note for myself to go and, and check it out. I know you and Drew were asking about it, so it's in there. Right on. I Any definitely other? liked it too. You liked it, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I use SketchUp a lot, so I really like checking out other references. I'm very new to this. I'm still work. I work in CNC and 3D printing. Awesome. But I broke into the Makerverse, and I'm just kind of sitting back and learning a lot from just listening and uh, looking at what other people are doing. So yeah, I really appreciated that video. Yeah, thank you. Have you have you got your M2 set up and stuff, Mike, or do you have a Maslow? Nope, it's not even out of the box yet. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Boy, yeah, let us know. I mean, we have these uh, these every week, so if you ever need help, um, you can hop in and you can you can send us a message to support. Um, like I mentioned to Dave, or you can check out in the Facebook group. Um, Absolutely, I will. Sure. Thank you. You bet. Did I help anybody else? Yeah, I have about a dozen questions. Well, sure, Glenn. See if I can help you out. All right. Um, my Z axis assembly, it does not fit my sled. Tightly. You're, you're what up. it is is the bolts that go to the bottom of the, yeah the bolts are too long. Uh, can you say that? The, can you say that one more the time? The sled though? does not. The sled will not fit tightly up against this. Or the z-axis assembly does not fit tight against the sled. It looks great when it's laying down, but you hang it up and it moves out. Okay. Uh, you know, millimeter or so. So like, this, and like yeah. the assembly itself is like wobbling. I can yeah, wobbles. I can I can answer why that happens. <laughs> so what I found out whenever I first got mine and I was assembling it several well a couple months ago, what I found was the bolts that go through the bottom of the sled into the rails, into these rails right here. Yes. What it would do is it would go through and it bottomed out in the bottom of the rail. I and haven't. So the screw was yet. tight. The screw was tight, but you could still move the rail on yeah. the slide. Now, my question is: uh, so, somebody answered me on Facebook. They said to grind the bolt, uh, and I was wondering if a washer would do the same thing. You could put a washer in it, but what I did was when you tighten those bolts down, they leave a mark. And I just went in with a drill and I just drilled through a little bit so that bolt could Great go idea. Way I, up through yeah. it. That I way I don't mind if my, my bolt is, I don't mind if I've got a, a five millimeter bolt or a six millimeter bolt, yes, a long one. If I drill the hole, then it could go all the way up in and I don't have to worry about bottoming that nut out anymore. So are, is it not, uh, the bolts that go on the side, like the, the M4 bolts, are, are those lining up with the holes? The two that go into yes. the side of the sled? Yes, they everything. Okay. The sled and those is all night. It's just. Yeah. 
it just doesn't want to suck the z-axis down onto the sled it's, it's got slight movement it's it's all tight but not tight enough um yeah so because that's what the other like the l brackets on the sides those can kind of help it go down too so you can you can like loosen that if you don't want to bore all the way through you can you can kind of like take that one out and try taking those two that are on the bottom uh, those two heads that are on the bottom off and then you can still when you because they're just to help you slide it on there um and it's it's an extra thing so you can take those off if you want and then just screw in from the side and then put those four l brackets on and that can secure it that'll secure it firmly too and make sure that it's on there. he's talking about the rails screwing down to the board oh from the bottom yeah so yes, sir. If, if you look at this yeah. what happened was my part. bolt would go all the way up and bottom out on okay. the bottom but it wouldn't tighten down on the board so all i did was i drilled through right here so you can put you can put a washer in there because the the bottom counterboard hole then is probably a little bit that's too much what there. i you can put a little washer just make sure that it's flush on the yes, bottom sir. So when your sled's moving around, if if it has any tension on the bottom, like if one of those bolts are out a little bit, it will drag, and then that will cause your cuts to go up, up and down and do weird stuff. Um, I'm having a, a lot of problems well, calibrating my uh, M2. I'm coming about three sixteenths out. Break up there, Dwayne. I'm not sure. Uh, kind of typical between eighth inch, three six. I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, is the are the machine settings the real critical point there, and getting your getting it calibrated tighter? Yeah, uh, more than three sixteenths. Yeah. Yes. Well, get get them some closer than three sixteenths. Yeah, I I think it might be my offset measurement that is off. So one for the machine using, settings. Which version of Makerverse are you using? Are you using version um, uh, one point oh six? The one okay, that so, is in your. Uh, so we have a. New I've had one. I've had a new one. We, yes, I've seen that post. I haven't. Yeah. And it's easier. It's easier to do the calibration, and it will give you the readouts of it. So it's one point one point two, uh, and it we have all the instructions and stuff for that. Um, it's on our new user manual too that you can find on our M2 resources page. I'll put the link right here um, so you guys can so you guys can get it. Um, and it's got the firmware and everything on there. So if I let me just go to it right now. Now in now in your calibration video, you talk about uh, Adreno and it doing some values already, and you said there was no need to set the invert. Uh, what's that? Three to four because it should already be done, but it's not being done in my Adreno, I believe it. My, the value for three is not four. I think it's zero. I'm, I can't remember, I don't have it hooked up in here. But. Um, so you can put you can put that in there, that G code what? in there, um, the three equals four, and then that'll invert your Z axis. Um, so in Make the Made 1.1.2, it has uh, edge calibration in it, and you measure your chains in it too. Um, which will help it to be more accurate, um, and you can and you can really dial in that accuracy and get it down to, to being just a couple millimeters or even better. I know some people that's even got it better than that um, by measuring the changes and working through that. It's a it's a little bit um, it's more involved calibration, so it goes through the different steps to help you really get it aligned because you'll it'll move like the sled each one of the corners, and then you'll measure how close it is on the corners, or even on my little frame it helps to measure it and calculate it too. So I think that can help you really dial in that accuracy because we added some stuff that used to be in Maslow and calculating the Maslow, uh, the first edition and added those calculation stuff in the new version of MakerBest. So I think that can help you. And, it, and if you want um, the instructions for Arduino, we're gonna be releasing a video on that uh, next week, but um, I can send you an email with the written instructions if you want, Dwayne, if you wanna just sure. send me a private message with your email um then i'll send that to you so yeah if you just click in the zoom to send a message just to me um and then you can put your email in there and then i'll i'll make sure i send it to you um and you get those arduino instructions and then you can you can get it loaded because what you'll have to do for the new version and this is great for everybody too uh is 
you have to uninstall 1.0.6 from your computer completely, and then uh, download Arduino, and then you plug in the, the file that you'll get in Arduino, and then you'll plug in your M2 and then load it. And then you'll close Arduino and then open the, and download the new version of Makerverse, and then it'll tell you if you have the right firmware, and it'll, it'll kind of walk you through everything. And, um, and the user manual, it'll walk you through how to set all that up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and there's one more point to that for your Z-axis. If you update to the new software and the new firmware, there's actually a point in there where you calibrate the Z-axis, and it says, do you want to invert your Z-axis, yes or no? Yeah, so, so like when I first that, did mine, it does that automatically for you. When I first did mine, it was going the wrong way, and I had to do that invert Z-axis, because it went the wrong way, and it was like, gah, 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 and I was like, whoa, <laughs> freaking out. Yeah, so uh, I would recommend like making sure it's in the middle too. Um, and then another thing I noticed with the Z axis is just go up and down when you're calibrating it because um, you'll reach the soft limit if you keep going down if it thinks that it's zero. So you just like, you'll, uh, you'll practice going up like 10 millimeters and then measure the distance and then have it go down 10 millimeters and then measure the distance. And, and, and I measured between and this, this is actually, this is a great thing to ask you guys on um, what point you measured on your Z-axis. So I measured, um, let me find out what y'all did. Oop, that didn't work. And I just turned my camera off, wrong button. There we go, switch to this one. So I got a caliper and measured right here when I was moving it. So between these two points. So like measure this and it might be, you know, like, 20.28 millimeters and then have it go down right. and then it's like 30.1 millimeters and then input those exact values with a digital caliper into into the program and then that will help so i, I want to put that in there in the new version that says like exactly where to measure it from so is that where y'all measured it from too or is there a better spot no that's where i measured it from and i mean it got right, right down to the nub i was like 0 0.01 millimeters me too yeah the first the it first was, time was off, and then the second time I was like, "Whoop, I'm perfect." And I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I expected to go up and down and run a couple of calibrations on it. The first calibration, I was three millimeters off. I hit it, did it one more time, and I was within, like I said, 0 0.01 mil. Yeah, I was, I was, I, I was uh, like super impressed with the with the program stuff that everybody's been working on on that the community and and, um, and Chris. Well, I've only made one cut with mine, and that was a setup cut. So, I how did it go? Wanting... When you cut it. I uh, did all right. I started with a square and then I got exotic and, and found this little SVG and I did this, this little. Oh, it was really off. There you go. That came out good. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, th was I it, thought it did. Was it skewed or was it, was it, I it mean, it was skewed a little bit. Yeah. The square bit. wasn't so good, but the circular, I, I'm kind of measuring my calipers and it, it, it was really tight. Awesome. Uh, that's one of my setup things. I'd go one direction and get it right on and I'd go the other direction and it'd be off. The new version of Makerverse will help with that for sure. Um, Cause that, that can really help you dial it in. And, um, and it'll, it'll even let you know like, Hey, your frame might not be level. At least, like, like check your stock and make sure that stuff like that. Like it'll give you some. Well, my, um, my, my top beam is bowed but I dial it in with a laser level from uh, yeah. from the motors right there at the gear. Yeah. I figured out, and that's level. Awesome. Yeah. So I think going and, um, and, and setting that up, and I haven't gotten your email yet. If you want to set, share your email with me, Dwayne. Uh, 12 foot beam, uh, is that? a larger chain yes you'll need 15 foot chains if you're going to do a 12 foot chain. Okay. oh i haven't yet no i'm not sure i'm new to zoom uh, i i used to hook my I, and when when covid started i got my kids going on my grandkids so they could do their schoolwork but i never paid attention to it much other than that. <laughs> i know it's so, like oh so you just now. click on your screen um you should be able to click the chat and then okay i'll figure it out go ahead and carry on the meeting um so with uh yeah so with the 12 foot beam and I, i'm not sure if anybody has a 12 foot beam in here 
uh, you can you can do that larger because there's some people in the community that have done that and then to get all the way to the very edge of their four by eight. Uh, one of the things that we found though is that if you move uh, your nail and have it go from an inch down and then six inches over, that can help you get to the edge too. So um, yeah. you can also do that to help get to the edge without having to get a 12 foot beam. But I know there's some people that swear on the 12 foot beam and they love it with the 12 foot beam and the 15 foot chains. So, oh, I got it. I see it right there, Blaine. Yep. Yeah. 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 I missed that. I was. There we go. Taking a note down. So, uh, with the 12, if you get a 12 foot beam and 15 foot chains, then that can help you get all the way to the very edges. But you can experiment with your nail too. That can also help you get to the edges too. Um, and just be aware though, if you go all the way to the edge, you want to make sure that you like watch I'm your gonna and hold it to you make have an sure extension. it balance yes off and, and make like a skirt like around just like it is on the bottom can i just yeah. Um, yeah so i'm gonna be building yes, uh i'm gonna build i'm building a workshop here like next month that i'm super pumped about and i'm gonna do that i'm gonna make a skirt like all the way around the edge um and i'm also gonna do one of the cords from the top um too so you can have like a bar come from so it keeps your z-axis above i really like that too oh yeah there's some yeah, I like that. Uh, the spring really stinks. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I want to go with the weight. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what's this for? Uh, you know, that's just that's just our gift to you. That's just our little gift Thank to you. you that we don't even know what it's for, but it's in there. <laughs> so, um, well, so I didn't that... even know. I didn't even know what the plastic bushings was until uh, I'm my chain popped off because it took off on me and I, I had to catch the sled rather than stop the motor and had a catastrophe, but nothing was broke. Um, and yeah, then so I noticed in your setup video that you had the little plastic cushion in, in the nail, but in your instructions, that part wasn't in there. So I kind of had to figure it out and just guess the measurements from the shot on the video. Was that really accurate? I didn't think it needed to be. It doesn't need to be. Yeah, that's why I didn't put it. That's why I didn't put it in there. It's basically just guiding the chain. So like yeah. I have it on my small chain because they get caught up because of the distance. They're not spread out as much. So because the yeah. chains are closer together, they like bind up on each other. If I don't have those little spacers, um, so that's what the that's why I use the spacers on my smaller frame. Uh, but the and then the nails coming out. That's to make sure that it doesn't tear your frame up. So that's kind of like the last thing. If something goes wrong, then that nail will pop out. Yeah, my nail. I pulled my nail. It was so pretty I've, exciting. I've done that too. <laughs> it, it could have been worse. It was. It was all good. Um, oil and lubricants, grease. Any suggestions? Dry lubricant. If you're going to do that, um, for sure. Like a like a like a dry a, a dry lubricant. I've, much oil one because like an oil based or a greasy one all the sawdust will stick to it so you recommend like a motorcycle chain lube a dry a dry chain lube yeah like a dry a dry lube like you use on a bike or something yeah like yeah i i, I took my bike chain lube on the chain i was yeah. wondering about on the on the, That's what I, did on, on the I don't remember the access uh, yeah I don't remember grease on this yeah and that's gonna you get grease on that z-axis it's gonna clog up yeah, because otherwise the sawdust will stick to it and it can cause problems. But I mean, um, yeah, and, and that's just to help keep the, the chains from like rusting if it's going to be like outside or something like that. So um, so it's like after use for a while, you probably you probably want to put some dry lube or something on there. Anybody else have any questions? I'm confused on this nail spacer thing. Where exactly are you putting those? So. That's not for everybody. Uh, it's it's for like non-traditional frame design. So the old Maslow, um, it had like the motors in the air and it had spacers to kind of keep the chains going on there. And you could 3D print chain guides and stuff. Um, and then on mine, I have them on, uh, let me switch my camera here again. Oh, 
There we go. Uh, so I have the space here. It's up here. So the, oh. they'll help keep the chain on there. So like as it's going across, it pulls it, and it keeps it. It keeps it from from popping off because my uh, my frame since it's smaller, the angle's less. So because the angle's less, the chains were like skipping on the top if I didn't put the spacers on there. So sometimes you can put them above or below the chain just to kind of help guide them um, and get them where you want them to go to keep them on the sprockets. Because if they start skipping off the sprockets, that's going to start moving your cut. And when I first started cutting with mine, I was like, what is going on? It'd be like, gur, 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 gur. and it was like, what is this thing doing? And then I realized I needed to have some, some way to like help keep them on there. And, and that was the way, that's the solution. This is the way. So Dan, you're in a, looks like you're beautiful, like Utah or something in your background, I'm digging that. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I'm actually in Austin, Texas, but this picture, nice. I took, we have, we just bought a vacation house in Utah. And awesome. this, this is the view out of our backyard. Yeah, I just watched Free Solo and that, that's what that reminds me of, of like, just like climbing up mountains. Yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the house is in Moab, Utah, and, and this is literally from our backyard here. Um, I had a couple of uh, things to talk about. Sure. One was, what is the, um, the thread on the screws that go into the motor? Because I want to buy, you know, like you're just talking about for that little roller spacer thing. I yes. want to I want to make one of the screws longer and run, you know, it's hard to explain without a picture, but for your for one of them. For your chain? So oh, I'm going to do sorry. something similar. I'm going to do something similar to what you had there, except, you know, how there's four bolts that hold the motor to the bracket. Yes. One of those screws, I'm going to replace the longer one and put that plastic bushing on it so that it will help hold the chain on. Okay. I have the, I'm using the, uh, the type where the chain goes over the, over the sprocket and then the, the weights hanging down with, you know, water jugs. Yeah. So, so it'd be like in the top, like in the top right corner or something, it'd be right above the gear. Actually. Yeah. So if you're going to look at the right hand motor, it would be the lower right corner where the screw is because that's where the chain comes straight down. And like right. we're just talking about, if you don't do something there, the, the chain pops off the sprocket when it's moving. Yeah, if you're using weights instead of a spring, yeah, yep. then, um, yeah, that, that, that can be that can be an issue. So what is what is the thread for that screw? I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, they're just small. But is it a metric or is it English? Do you have any idea? Um, I think in the let's see if I say I think I I just it's just called a um, a small screw. I don't think it's. I think I even call them the small screws. Let me look in the in the guide because I don't remember off the top of my head. But so, I mean, when you when you buy them, you gotta have some specific size, right? Um, yes, uh, but really, if it fits in there, you should be good. Uh, well, I just so want to know what to buy. Let me look here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> I could probably just take one to Home Depot or whatever, and they got a thread gauge there. I can figure it out from there. Yeah, and you can kind of like measure it. I'm, I can. I don't have a, a a gauge with me. I could take one off and then look at the. At well, the well, I'm just saying, since you buy all the stuff. Um. Yeah, I mean, I could. Uh, I could just unscrew one. Yeah. Well, since you since you buy all the stuff, you would know what it is, right? Uh, well. My memory is not that good. <laughs> All right, let me measure it for you. So yeah, it's a little, it's a little metric one. Uh, but I got this sweet little metric gauge that I created for myself, and we'll just find out right now. I'm pretty sure it says in the user manual what it is. So this thing is awesome. This little 3D printed metric gauge. So it'll tell you like exactly which one it is. So it is an M4, and it is. um eight millimeters long with a little one yeah yeah okay I'm, I'm just gonna need longer ones that's my point i'm gonna get one long enough that i can still screw it in appropriately and then put the bushing on it and that'll help that's an M4. Hold, yep that'll help hold on my uh hold on the chain onto the sprocket that's what i'm looking for Absolutely, yeah yeah so just this m4 metric and then um yeah this one's eight but yeah if you got if you got the like the longer one like a 16 or Probably yeah. need to be longer than that. It might need to be like 24 or something for that white yeah, space. Yeah, I'll measure how long the bushing is and then figure it out from there. Um, another thing is the the control software. I think that's called Makerverse. Is that the right name? I I know. It is. Okay. Yes. 
So in Makerverse, when you first start up fresh, when you've not done anything at all yet, and you're going through all the steps and you get to the calibration phase, it, you just follow it through step by step by step, which is great. But then you get to the part where it says exercise the Z axis. As soon as you click that, it goes crazy because you haven't set a zero yet. So whoever wrote Makerverse, can we get them to add a thing in there that either automatically zeroes it when you first fire it up, or there's a button somewhere where you can set the zero? Uh, I, have my, I had my sled in the middle and everything. It was all ready to go. And I was just following the steps. And as soon as I got to that move the Z axis, both both of the chains tightened up. So it, you know it, the sled went straight up and, and crashed. And that was 1.1.2, 1. 1. right? Whatever the newest one is, I think yeah. it's yeah, 1.1.2. 1. 1. 1. 1. Okay, yeah. So, so there was no, I and I'd read enough in the forums to know that I needed to set the zero before I did anything, but there was no place for me to do that. I wasn't able to set zero anywhere before that point. So when I went through, so what like when I went through Makerverse, mine already had a zero set, so that's why mine didn't trigger. Right. Uh, so if you think that. I totally so fresh. That's, a, that's an awesome thing. I will make sure that that is in um, in the request as soon as we get done with this. I'll make sure that that's in here. Um, so either you know, on very first when it's a fresh startup, it's automatically set to zero, or it's, or, yeah, because otherwise it'll just run away because yeah. it, it doesn't and, have and, any reference point, and it'll just take the sled will just be like, I'm going to the moon, and it, it, went, just, it went straight up and crashed into my frame. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that that, that, that gets updated for you. For so sure. Even though I knew I had to do it, there was no way for me to do it. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very good, that's a very good um, bug request to make sure that we get in there. And the last thing I had was I wasted a week. I mean, I finally got the help I needed in, in Facebook. But um, like I had posted a couple of times, um, my X and Y axis were both reversed. And I couldn't figure out how to, because I was doing the, the chain going over the sprocket instead of the normal way under with the springs. Um, and that's why it was reversed. And the um, in uh, Makerverse, the uh, setting that says if your chains go over or under, um, all that really does is it changes the computations. It doesn't actually reverse the directions. So you need okay. to use the dollar sign three, the dollar sign three uh, parameter, which everybody knows goes zero for, zero for the normal z-axis or four for the reverse z-axis. But that also can change your x and y axes. There's a document I, I posted it in the forums in, in the uh, Maslow forums. Um, okay. so, someone else had told me about it in in Facebook. Um, but there's a whole chart that lists all different eight possible combinations of which axis you're going to reverse or not. So for oh, me, I needed okay. to reverse all three axes and make it dollar sign three equals seven. So. so if it had like a drop down menu where you could change to re to switch your axis when you're going on, oh, that, like before that would, you start, um, that would be awesome. Yeah, calibration. Yeah, someplace <clears throat> maybe in the maybe in Makerverse calibration area mm -hmm. where they where the place where you say um, chains go over or chains go under have another pull down there that says reverse the x axis, reverse the y axis, and reverse the z axis, mm -hmm. and it's just a dollar sign three uh, value. That'd be awesome. So. Um, do you know where that you said you posted that in the forums? Do you have the link of where that is that I can I, go and I find? can I can get it in a minute. Hang on. That'd be awesome. If you could drop that in the chat for everybody here and then for me to reference. Because one of the things that I want to do is is work with making the language in 1.1.2 more clear to be because it's kind of confusing um, to go through and, and for the steps, especially for a beginner. So I I, I love to hear the, that type of feedback and stuff. So we can make sure that it's going to be easiest for you to go through and, and those things like making sure zero set and making sure that um, that the that that reverse switch in there is that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So here's because everybody has different setups. So if it would say like if you have a standard frame, then stay here. But if you have yeah, a non-standard, and just like when I, you choose the sled, it's like if your sled is the eight. Yeah. And yeah. I can't I can't think of a situation where this would happen. But you might have some situation where somebody's got the x axis reversed and not the y or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Like when I was goofing around, here, I just put the here's the forum mm -hmm. post. Here's the awesome. forum post, and then here's here's a link to the um to the magic document that got me going. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, it, this this document is in the last post of that forum message. Okay. But um, this that PDF file was magic because it it listed what all the different combinations of dollar sign three are. Oh yeah. And it had a lot of other stuff too. Let it doesn't exactly. it doesn't include the Maslow specific stuff, but it has a lot of the generic Gerbil settings, which was great. Anyway. Yeah, for like homemade DIY DCNC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
non non Maslow. I stuff. haven't seen it before, so yeah, this is great. So anyway, yeah, that to me, I, I wasted more than a week just sitting around with my sitting on my hands because my machine was ready to run, but the X and Y were backwards. Yeah. So finding this magic document was uh was the key. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that you got frustrated, Dan. Uh, hey, it, I, it's, it's working it's, now, so I, I'm good. Good. Okay. Yeah. So like, it's it's a it's a kit, and it's part of the, it's for me. I love learning about that process and figuring out that kind of stuff. But I know how frustrating it could be for 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 new users that that. It don't like to tinker as much as I do. <laughs> you, you can tell by my gray hair that I wasn't born yesterday. And <laughs> I've, I've been doing, well, when I was in high school back in the 70s and early 80s, I was doing a CNC project as as work. That was my job. Oh, well, you know CNC. way more than me then. <laughs> so, so I've been around CNC for a long time, but I haven't had yeah. time or ambition enough to get my own. It's like over the last 40 years, I've been saying, oh, yeah. You know, and I'll buy pieces for one, you know, like a homebrew thing is someone says, you know, go to Home Depot and buy these pieces and all that stuff. But I never was able to pull it all together. So finally, finally, I got one now. Well, you are an expert compared to me because I've only been doing CNC like six months. So <laughs> like, uh, so I 3D printing is my, that's what I've been doing for years. So, so, um, so, I, so I knew that I should be able to get it working and that's why it was extra frustrating too. Yeah. Well, that's why that this feedback is great. And this like, um, this info that, that I'll, I'll put it in our future requests and stuff when you know, today when this meeting's up for sure. So thanks a lot. All right, I've, I've sucked up enough time. I'll leave it to somebody else. It's fine. Like, like I was saying with Dave, this is what this is all about. So. <laughs> Quick question. Where did you get that 3D screw guide? Is that Thingiverse? Oh yeah, this. Yeah, it's on Thingiverse. Here, I'll post a link for it. It's awesome. I use this thing all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Let me, uh, let me, I'll find it real quick for you guys. Um, Another thing I did because I'm basically lazy is I printed a little uh, centering tool so that you can center the router in the sled hole real quick. Because I didn't feel like trying to measure it. Can you post a link to that or is it available somewhere? I haven't put it up on Thingverse, but I can. Do you have a 3D printer? Well, not at home, but I got one at work. Um, the other thing is I was thinking maybe just making a simple one out of just and just put it in the maker you know, in the maker machine. There you go. Just like that. That's the, that was the very first thing I printed or I, I cut. So I, my machine is, hasn't cut anything yet. I'm, I'm ready to this afternoon. I'm going to make three, three donuts out of two by four. And it's going to, and I'm glue it together. And it's going to be my, what I call a pen router. It's going to fit in the same spot as the router, but it'll have a pen with a rubber band on it. After, uh, so I can check stuff before I cut it. That's actually, that's actually a good idea. Yeah, I seen another post uh, in Facebook again, where somebody had made a ring kind of like this. There you go. But they made the center large enough to take a uh, to take a marker like a marks a lot. That's and like what he did was he put it in there and then he would run a program, and it was making like you know Christmas cutouts, yard art and stuff. Yep. But it went in and it traced everything out, and then all he would do is run the second program that would just cut the outside out. Then he had perfect lines where he had to paint. I want to do that too, except on mine, the, let's see if I can see this here. The, instead of be, the pen being fixed in there, it's going to be on a rubber band. So that when the Z-axis when the Z -axis goes down to cut deeper, the pen doesn't get totally smushed. It'll just, it'll just push up with a rubber band. Yeah, just like move up in the air. That'd be sweet. Yeah, so the, so the pen will be, will be spring loaded with a well, rubber band loaded. I call it spring loaded. Um, so that as the Z-axis goes down and deeper, it won't kill the pen. So, yeah. I've seen somebody do that with a printer too, like put a pen on the printer so that it can move around and draw yeah. um, and do some really cool stuff with that too. Did I hear somebody say that they made, when I was looking that up, like a guide for their bits? Did I hear somebody say that? Or did I just make that up? Yeah, a little, yeah, that little center thing. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we, and that's floating around somewhere. I need to, I need to track that file down. Um, All it is, uh, well, it's real simple for anybody that's just getting ready to fire their unit off. Get it fired off, calibrate it, and then cut a three-inch circle with a quarter with a one-eighth inch bit drill through the center. Mm -hmm. And then I cut that out and I saved it. And that's my centering jig because I have two different sizes of of routers. So I have the oh, so you have like a ninety-one. Yeah, I have a Dewalt, and then I have the larger one that's on here now. That it is two point two horsepower, so it has the larger ninety-one millimeter clamp. 
so if I put this in, then I can, it's easy for me to just loosen up the bolts and recenter my, recenter the, the Z tower that's on there. But that's the first thing I think anybody should make is a centering jig. Yeah. So what, uh, what routers do you, do you use? I have the DeWalt, the six, uh, what is it? 611, I that's think. It, I yeah, the, yeah, the one you got there, the yeah. 611. And then I have uh, this one right here. This is a uh, larger 2.2 horsepower. Bosch Colt? Yeah, it's a Bosch. A Bosch, yeah. the 618 EBS, I think it is. Yeah. But I find that I use that 618 a lot more because it's not, it doesn't have higher RPM, but it has higher torque. So I can actually get my plunge rate a little bit faster and it'll almost cut my cut times in half. So you can cut just, each pass, you can do deeper. Just to, that's just right. To... That's right. I st I'm still only going 2025 20, IPS, right? So I, I, I'm going through there, but I can get it to plunge deeper and cut a little bit more. And okay. the motor doesn't overheat. It cuts like a dream. So that's kind of the, my default. But I have that little one I'll use. Actually, I haven't used it for a long time now. I've just been st stuck with this one. What cool. is the absolute limit on cutting speed? Is it gravity pulling on the sled or is it the motors? I've found that it's based on the absolute cutting speed is based on your bit and your whatever router you have, like the little DeWalt. That will, I peg that one doing an amp conversion on it. I pegged it at right around 28,000 RPM. This larger one that I got here, this 2.5, the max I've seen that thing is 25,000 RPM. So one runs faster, you know, than the other. They're all variable speeds. But the reality is, is the bit itself and then the wood that you're cutting. Yeah. To be honest with you, my, I rarely, I rarely go outside of 20 to 25. 25 is my absolute max. And that's if I'm just cutting out a square or something, a simple shape. 20 is where I usually, that's my default for anything like this one right here. I made a sign for my wife, the state of Texas, right? Spoiled oil field wife. But with that one right there, the engraving and everything, that one I ran at, at 20. But I, like I said, I can go deeper on the plunge rate. And how long did that take you to do? Did that maybe take like an hour, hour and a half? This one right here? Yeah, this, well, that one right there with There's the deeper the deeper plunge rate on that one, I want to say it was right at an hour and 10 minutes. If I did it with the DeWalt at the recommended plunge rate of half of the bit diameter, it was about two hours and 30 minutes or something. Yeah. So I was able to really reduce that by going a little bit deeper every time. Yeah. And then that's, that's what I've noticed on mine too. Like I can't go, if I try to go too deep, then it will slow it down. It'll start to like, gah, 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 gah. and, and it, it'll to... like drag it. And then my cuts won't go straight. Well, um, the other thing I found DeWalt, is... it just really can't get the, like the torque that it needs to. Yep. The other thing I found with that DeWalt, that's why I bought this one. But whenever I go down in my plunge rate in the DeWalt and it's sliding, it'll actually jump the board. The sled will jump because the bit doesn't have the torque to go through the wood. It'll sit there and vibrate, oh jump, and then you have a really crappy edge. So my recommendation to anybody is to go to the 2.5, get the 91 millimeter clamp and have at it. <laughs> That's the way I did it. I have a question um, for, yeah. for the speed of the DeWalt. You know, that's a variable speed on there and it goes up to six or whatever. Do you always run it at the max speed or do you, do you ever turn it down or what speeds? So I just finally cut some some plastic, some, I guess, Lexan stuff that I got at Lowe's that, um, takes that take took a little lower speed because it was chipping the top, but then that also depends on the bit. So I was just using a flat two fluted bit and you can cut the plastic, but I slowed it down to, I want to say it was at four on, on the speed that seemed to be the right. I didn't check the RPM on it, but it was at four on my router. And I dialed the inches per second, the, the speed, the inch, the feed rate on it. I dialed that way down to where I was doing 20. So it took extra long to cut it, but I had really nice, crisp, clean edges. 
And then for all you guys, you know, the little trick is if once you cut something out in glass like that, a plex, plexiglass or something, just take a torch and run around the edge and it makes the edges clear as well. You don't have that white so, crappy edge. That's an awesome tip. I'm going to cut just, something. It just glosses it. It just glosses the edge. Yeah. That's it. That's awesome. And then kind of hold it to help it so it doesn't chip and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 I'm going to cut some plexiglass stuff here pretty soon. I'm making, yeah. I have a little cat door that I'm <laughs> making in the window <laughs> and I'm going to do plexiglass on it. So, um, yeah, that's good to know. I, I, I tune mine when I cut wood, I cut it like six. I cut it like the max. But if it starts to burn, like if it's a softer wood and you see it turning black or something like that, that means it's too hot. If you're going, you're spinning too fast, so you can kind of turn it down a little bit. But mostly I cut at the higher RPM. I don't have tons of experience really with turning variable speeds, but just like Casey said, it depends on the material. So if you're going to print something softer, if you go cranking at it, then it'll, you know, it'll just chip and it can, you know, splinter off parts and stuff like that. The only other time I've seen it burn like that was two times. A, I had a bad bit. I, I run my bits until they're absolutely, totally dead. So if you have a bad bit, it'll burn because it won't cut. And then the other one is if you're running your system, your the inches per, the feed rate, the inches per minute, if you're running it too slow. So you can actually run it too slow to where it doesn't get enough cut. It sits in that spot spinning at 25,000 RPMs too long it'll actually make the edges black all the way around. So that's kind of how I found that 20 to 25. That kind of ended up being the sweet spot. And I know this is just junk wood, but if you guys look at it, I mean, it's got every little nick and cranny. There's no chip yeah. out. It's nice and straight, Good. nice and flat. See. Did you use a down cut for that? Uh, that, was, that was actually the up cut bit. Okay. Yeah, because awesome. yeah, it didn't fray the, the top even. So well, yeah, it's chipboard, right? I think I paid four dollars for a two by two square of that at, at Lowe's. So that's it was junk board. I, I use that to build jigs for the rest of my shop, my table saws, my band saws. Uh -huh. So I use it's funny, I use the Maslow to create jigs for other equipment. Because <laughs> it's big, you can do big stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. Table saw sleds and everything else. I can make a I can make a, a two and a half, three foot table saw sled easy. Nice. Well, does anybody else have any questions? About any stuff? Anybody got any projects they're working on or anything like that? Um, so I actually have a question. Um, yeah. What's up, Dustin? My, my shop recently uh, purchased the CNC and like 3D printer combo. 3D printer works amazing and probably one of the best 3D printers I've used. Um, in a while. I said probably one of the best 3D printers I've used in a while. Thank you so much. Thank you so I, much. I, just, I love that little that little homing thing, that little homing solenoid and everything. That's yeah. like made prints go so much easier. I haven't had a single print crash so far, and I've done 40 plus prints on it. That is but fantastic. The CNC, however, is where we're having a lot of issues in okay. terms of calibration being i i've tried to calibrate the thing because it said like oh you can ca like keep calibrating it and hopefully it'll hone in better and everything like when you go to the edge like you go to the right edge you go to the uh center edge and all that jazz um i'm still getting values of like 23 or 30 millimeters off and cuts are very wonky um for some reason it won't even do a straight line on a certain cut we're trying to um we're trying to see and see out so that way, well, I mean, we ended up just doing it by hand because I couldn't figure out how to get it working properly. But basically we were trying to see and see out um, a custom apron um, for a stage. Um, and it had a straight edge on it. It had two straight edges on it. It would do Y and, and it would do it, a, it would do a straight edge. But then when it would do X, it would start making a weird little arc the whole way across. And I have no idea why it created the arc because I checked it with support. Support said my G code was fine. I sent them my file, my file, my SVG file was fine. Um, but it kept doing this stupid little arc and I could not figure out for the life of me, the chain seemed taut. Um, the, I've, like I said, I've tried calibration and I don't understand why I can't get any further than like 23 millimeters in terms of calibration. So it's probably not your, it's probably not your files. Um, do you have a support board that comes across your waste board right here? That goes across the top? Oh, like it behind it to keep it from, yes. 
to keep it from bowing. Because it sounds like that that is from, that, that has something to do with the frame. If it's off by that much, it sounds like it's a frame issue. So um, the first thing is to make sure that your material is not bowed. So um, like on mine, I have to, on this little one, I have one um, across the top right here and then one on the bottom and then one in the middle too. So to mm -hmm. help it flatten it out and to, to keep it flat all the way across. Because if it bows out, that will cause it to arc over and do weird things because you're going across like a large area. So as it's moving, it will like, it's, it's basically following the wood as the wood bows. So it's kind of following it around. So that's the first thing. That I would check but if you've got those support boards in the back then that's good it might not be that the second thing is making sure that your waist board is level all the way across and your top beam is level all the way across so uh, above each one of the motors and in the middle so making sure that the whole thing is level even if it's bowed out a little bit you want to make sure that it's level all the way because they both have to be level with with each other and then they also need to have at least 18 inches between the, the motors and the top of your wasteboard. So you got to make sure that it's up high enough. Um, and so, if it's not up high enough, then it, it won't be able to make the calculation correct and it might slant. Um, okay. so it, I, I do easy. have that. I, I, I do have that. Um, and so they have to be level with each other. They don't, they don't necessarily have to be level with the floor, right? Because we, because uh, what is it? You guys had said make some kind of wall like attachment to the wall and everything and we said no nah, we can't do that we don't have space on our wall we have a big paint frame in the way we can't do okay. that so we ended up making our own frame still at the 15 degrees and still following like all the other measurements and everything and the 18 inches clearance um so the header and the waste board needs to be level with each other but it doesn't necessarily have to be level with the floor because we have a very uneven floor if it's sitting at an angle and they're level with each other, it would be like on a printer. But gravity, like, so like a 3D printer, like I could tip this on its side and it could still print because it's pressure and it's moving around. But because gravity is pulling this down, if it's off a little bit, the gravity can be pulling the sled. And, it, and so if it's really level, like uneven, then it could pull the sled and that could cause one of your cuts to kind of go sideways. So you might have to put like, a little shim or something underneath one of the tires to help get it level because you want it to be level with itself and level with the floor like you want to try to get it as level like whatever material surface it's sitting on you want to make sure that it's level and it adds that 15 degree planar angle um those are the big things so and if you got the brackets and that's fine so my guess is it might be off even if it's a tiny bit like if it's off a millimeter or two let's say it's off like a, like you know sixteenth of an inch or just a couple millimeters from one side to the other well, that's a that's a 10 foot beam and then now it's like whoop, just a tiny bit and then when it's pulling it it's going to like slowly be slanting as it goes across um okay. so i that's that's what my gut is kind of telling me that that could be and somebody else in here might have a suggestion too um for something I, i've got a suggestion if i can even though sure. i'm doing mine doesn't work my calibration came out at one millimeter and it seems to be drawing everything straight so based on that is the only way i'm going to claim i got any knowledge here um, oh, my phone's ringing. Gordon, it's always right when you want to talk. That's what, that's what everybody wants to talk about. It's, it's a call I got to take, sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, I guess also um, one thing being, I've noticed that, I don't know if this also has anything issue, uh, any issue with it, is that sometimes when it's cutting, it seems like the sled it's set, like the router's going along and everything, it's going along smoothly, but then like I noticed that the bricks, they like, it starts to like twist and do this as it's cutting. What What's wrong there and why does it keep doing that? So that could be an RPM that we were talking about that it's getting caught and it's and it's ha it's struggling to like pull itself over. So you can try to turn up your RPM speed. That's one thing that you can try. And then another thing is making sure, so the ring, uh, the roller bearing carriage that goes around the outside, you want that is it's a variable um, movement so you can move it and you want to set it on the same plane as the chains coming off the motors and if it's not then that can cause it to like pull and pull it in weird ways because you can you can move this up and down based on whatever material you're putting on your wasteboard so like if it's pulled out then you'll have it like the top max and then if it's something that's that's smaller well then you might push it pull it down or like put it back down on there a little bit and then like make sure that it's lined up 
where it's coming off your motors and it's straight. It's not coming out at an angle. Um, and that could be causing it to you. You want it to be straight and not going up or down because um, that can also cause the chains to skip, which could also cause it to move slightly. <laughs> so um, that would be something that I would check too. So um, make sure that the frame is level and everything looks level on it. Uh, and then make sure that that roller bearing carriage is pulled up and then make sure that your RPM speed is up um, pretty high. Those would be the three things that I would check for you. <laughs> Um, to see. Are, you, are you saying that that adjustment is critical enough that it should be checked every time you put material in the machine? Like you don't have to always do it, but if you're seeing some big, like if you are putting up something, you know, you're trying to cut something that's like half an inch or something like that, then yeah, it's probably a good idea to check it and move it. Um, like my, mine's small, so I have to move it a lot. Um, so it might be different on the full size frames. You might be able to get a little bit of a leeway between, you know, like a quarter of an inch or something, but that is something that you want to, that you want to change and, and make sure that it's straight coming off because it'll skip the chains off. Um, and they'll, they'll pop off and, um, and it, and it can cause the sled to kind of move because it's like pulling, it's like, as it's pulling over, it's not straight. So it's like, it's pulling it like this and that's what can kind of cause it to rock. But if it moves a little bit, that's okay. But it's just, when it's like this. That's, you don't want it to be like moving like that. <laughs> yeah, so just, just a couple of quick points on that. So your sled, whenever it turns like that, remember that you got a friction coefficient between board and board. It's gonna be sliding and the bricks are there to design to pull down on it and kind of rock it back and forth when it does have that. So this stuff here, put that on, buy that and put it on the bottom of your board. That makes it like glass, so it reduces. On the sled? That. Yeah, it just just put it on the bottom of your the bottom of your sled, and that'll reduce that. Your frame, as long as your frame is square to the top board, you should be good. But I will say that this new, the new Makerverse calibration, it will tell you if your frame, your cut board, is skewed to your mm -hmm. top board. I just actually updated mine the day before yesterday. And it told me that my cut board was, had a clockwise skew two millimeters. Yep. And you know what? Two millimeters over an eight foot span is pretty darn good. That means my system's pretty square. But what was nice was the software could see that after doing two or three rounds of calibrations. It seen that. Yeah. So I know, calibration. Yeah, I know that, you know, my board's pretty darn close. I mean, it, it two millimeters over 10 feet is is excellent. I mean, that's pretty darn good. So, but just my floor in my garage is slanted. That's the way the concrete's poured. And all I did was whenever I put the top beam across, I used a level. And then whenever I put the, the waste board up on the wall, I made sure that I snapped a line with a chalk line, made sure that it was level with that board. And then whenever I leaned it up there, of course, because my board, my floor is slanted, um, I just had to jog this out a little bit. I'll let you guys Put see some this. Let me know if you can see that. You see mm -hmm. what oh, yeah. Perfect. See, I ended up screwing this on because this board, because oh, the board yeah. planted, I ended up putting this board on to get that 15 degree angle mm -hmm. and keep it there. And because, I mean, I'm actually at um, my top board is at 15.6 degrees and my waist board is at 15.2. So it's dialed in pretty good. But if, you're, if your line is cutting angular, let me show you this here real quick. So I think I got one on here someplace, but it shows an angled cut. It's 12 o'clock. Where it went through. Ah, I must have thrown it away. But if your cut is going, if you have a perfect side cut, but the top and the bottom are skewing down or skewing up, mm -hmm. that happened to me because the one of the teeth on my Y side, the chain jumped one. Mm -hmm. So from then on, the calibration is completely out of whack. You got to start from scratch, recalibrate. And the way I, I fixed the chain issue was from here, if you look at the, the chain that's right here, mm -hmm. take a, a tape measure and measure from here to the board all the way across. And it should be the same measurement. If it's flush with your cut board, then you should be good all the way up to your motors. 
So that's what I ended up doing. To make sure that it's the exact same chain link between your sled and the top of the motor. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so Makerverse 1.1.2 is is it, that's what you're using, Dustin? Is that what you're using? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it, it, it'll walk you through like that team calibration step and to measure those out and make sure that they're all straight. So, okay, um, so that actually did not make sense at like that was very confusing language on there. And I didn't really understand how I was supposed to do it. What I gathered from it, which it seems goofy and I feel like an idiot for doing it because it didn't. Nope, really I'm an idiot. Sense I'll say that. But um, so basically I because I had already set it up in 1.06 or whatever, and it didn't have all that stuff in it. And then I tried to redo it with one with the newest one. And so I took my off and then I had my chains and then it was saying something about lining the cotter pin up to the center of the board, which yeah. didn't make sense because I was like, there are two cotter pins. Which cotter pin are you talking about? Do you want me to take the chains, oh. put them together and put the cotter? Yeah, so I, okay. I cut my chains. For those of y'all that have been in some of these, I had the chains like hanging up off of here. Um, but I had to cut them for the new version because I tried to overlay it um, and kind of have it like link to link like this. Mm -hmm. um, and But with the cotter pin, I couldn't get the measurement to come down straight. So what that means is to take each one of the ends. So like this end, and then let's say that like this part of it. Then you have the other end right here, which there's a so you take both of these ends like this and then that, put them that, together and put the cotter pin through them. So that would actually be in your in your example, you're just using one piece of chain, but you're really talking about using two chains. Both the chains. Yes. So the, the, the places where they would connect at the springs, the right, right end of the chain. Uh, no, the, the end that goes to your sled. Okay. Yeah. So you'll take that, those ends of the of the chain. And so it's like, once you get uh, it nailed up there, then you'll take that and you'll put the, the cotter pin like through the ends and it has to be in the very end so, hole of the so, loop. So undo both cotter pins off your sled so your sled's not attached. And then Correct. take each end of that chain and just take one of the cotter pins and hook the, and then hook the two chains Correct. together. Yes. And then you'll use the Y to kind of jog it up and it'll, it'll go up to be straight. And what I did, since I have a six foot beam is I measured across and got the exact center and measured in the exact center. So you'll want to do that on your beam too, because 10 feet, if you got like a 10 foot board, it might not be completely 10 feet. So it might be like 10 feet to quarter or something. So like make sure that's in the exact center and then jog it up with the Y and then use the X to kind of move it side to side. And I want to make this more clear too, because I, when I did it, I also thought that it was kind of confusing and trying to go through it. And I'm not experienced with CNC as much. So I want to make that way more clear um, so you know how to line it up in the middle and then your your ends on your gears, when it's lined up in the exact center, one of those teeth should be lined up too. And that's how you know that your chains are all the way across and then they're straight. And then you'll jog it down to the center. And I want that to be a little bit more clear to basically jog it down so you can put your, your sled close to the center of your actual waste board. And then you'll reattach it and then you'll like have it go to home. Ha so it's having it's kind of cut it's it's it is absolutely complicated. <laughs> having um, having some having some photos or a sample video of all that would be awesome. Uh, I am I, working on it. Because uh, I because I ended up I did do all of that, I did do it all correctly, but it was kind of a crapshoot if I was doing it right or not. Yeah, so I haven't started using 1.1.2 except like the past two weeks is when I've been I've been using it and like utilizing it. I've been on 1.0.6, uh, and then I moved transferred to this one as this one's about to come on to the um, to the app stores and everything. So I kind of transition. I'm transitioning with everybody else too. So um, I, I, I love all this feedback and stuff about it because I want to make that way more clear. Um, to be able to, to I did have some possible uh, useful information for Destin as well. Is, is it okay if I share my screen? Uh, yeah, I think I can give you access to that as long as you don't do anything wild and I have to kick you out. <laughs> it's a CAD drawing. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Let me. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, you should be able to do it. There, can everybody see this CAD drawing? Yep. Yeah. 
So this is like a side view of the frame that I built and the motors go up on top up here. Can you see my cursor too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the motor goes here and the gear is approximately right where the tip of my cursor is. Mm -hmm. So it's important to measure from, when you measure to the top of the wasteboard, you don't go just a straight line down to here. You right. measure, yeah, you, no, you, you do an imaginary line down to here and you measure this distance. So it's, it's actually how far, it's how far above this plane of your wasteboard yeah. is where the gear is. So you, 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 um, you measure the distance from here to here and then the distance from here to here and add those two together. So it's, yeah, not, so, it's not this well, diagonal distance, it's the, it's the actual... It, it's parallel with the plane, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, yeah, another way to think of it is if you imagine moving the gear back to here and then measure this distance. So if you, yeah, get, so, that, if you get that number right, it's, it's important too to get a nice straight cut. That's an excellent point. And that's something that I want to clear up in the language too, to know that you have to come down in the same plane if you go straight down then that's not going to be the same angle it's yeah. got to be on the same plane like because yep. you want the chains to be on the same plane as your cut at that, that 15 degree angle like yep. all the way down so um yeah thanks for sharing yeah. that. another way to think of it is if your sled is here in the um the, what's it called the uh the half circular metal thing where the chains hook onto the um it's a roller band carriage yeah that so that's the other way to think of it is what's the distance from for, you know, in that in that direction where your chains would go, how much is the distance from? The, oh, I'm making it more confusing now. Never mind. Just I'll just shut up here. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I got what you were saying, and that that was very helpful. Thank you. No, yeah. I, and also I like I kind of like your setup a little bit better than ours, so I might end up changing to that one. Yeah. So I use the uh, I use this level um, to stick it out, so I could get it on the same plane. So I could make sure, like I stuck this out and then add another piece on there too, uh, to make sure that I was on the same plane. And I want to make that way easier to do, um, to try to figure out that calculation in that angle. So um, thanks a lot um, for that. I also have one more quick question. I'm sorry, I'm taking yeah. up a lot of time, but no, you're fine. Um, we're really frustrated with this damn thing. Um, so for some reason, I set up the workplace and everything, and then I logged out of the machine took my computer home and then I came back Thank to it and for, sorry oh I was talking to Dan um I might just change this to own voice I think that will there we go um yeah what's up and sorry, for some reason after I had set up the initial workspace and everything I can't get back into that same workspace I keep connecting my machine to my computer and then it just says create a new workspace I was like I already have a workspace let me log into that one and it won't let me do it so this could this is a, it's on the side and it's it's probably it doesn't have the icon on it, so it might be in the side that you can click on it. That's a bug that that that's in there that we're going to get fixed. Like it's there, it's just in it's blank. <laughs> there, <laughs> you yeah, look, I had, I had the same problem too. That there's a little there's a little icon that looks like a house and then a blank space and then a gear for settings. The blank space in the middle is your old settings. Yeah, oh, so like okay. it keeps stretching because it's you probably have a whole bunch of different workspaces in there. Okay. And that would be another feature request I would have is can you delete workspaces or edit them so you could add an icon? Deleting workspaces is a good one because I don't think that's in there. I know that I that icon- I to deleting workspaces one in the gear settings because I kept looking, I could see the, I could see my current workspace and everything that I had. And then all I could do was edit or delete and I couldn't get into it. There's a little <laughs> trash can icon somewhere in there. I um, I tried to edit it though. I just I just wanted to add an icon to it because I realized my mistake that I didn't oh. add an icon the first time through. Another yeah. feature request would be to have a default icon that just you get this one, but you can change it if you want. But so it's not a, just a blank space. That's the what we have is like to make it a default so it doesn't like it, does, it like make it a default icon so then it's not like blank um, on there because I noticed the exact same thing when when I started it up too. So. Well, uh, thank you for your advice. Um, I got to go. I got to get to class. So thank yeah. you guys. Take care. Yeah. Hey, if you need any help, check out the Facebook group or send us a message at support at makermade.com and, and we'll get you going. We're here to work Thanks. with you to get it printed and to get cut. So yeah. Thanks, so, yeah. Guys. All right, guys. So I have a, I have a hard stop um, at 1230, but if you guys have any more questions, we're a little bit over on time. I don't know if anybody has any more questions or I want to make sure we have enough time to get everybody. Um, See you, Travis. Good a note. Travis, you're back. I saw. I, I heard that Joel got you going. I think right. Uh, hold on. Let me turn my video. Kind of. 
So I will say my calibration now is one millimeter. However, why not? I have repeated the process a hundred times and I did nothing different. So I'm a little bit, you know, I feel like I'm walking on ice because I don't know how I achieved the better calibration. So I did get the pin orientation corrected, but everything else was doing the exact same thing. So I must have either miscounted the number of chain lengths before when I thought they were different. Yeah, like um, in the very end. But effectively, I took, I had a nice clean board on there. I took it off and put it back on the waist board and did my calibration. And it landed spot on in the center where usually when I was dropping it, it was over by quite a bit. So Great. I'm kind of rolling with it for now, but I don't know that I'm confident that I could repeat it and get one millimeter again. One millimeter is good. Like you're, you're dialing it in. What, it's, Out of curiosity, what does what does one millimeter mean? That's there's twenty five point four millimeters in an inch. No, no, no. I, sorry, I know that. Does it mean I'm within a millimeter from one end to the other, or does it mean any spot I tell it to go to, it could be within a millimeter of that? It means that it's within a millimeter when it's cutting, like and it's cutting across. It's within a millimeter across a ninety six inch span when it's going when it's cutting everything and going along. Yeah. So that's good. Well, that's awesome. I guess what I'm asking is what kind of precision can I expect on, you know, let's say I cut a square that's one inch by one inch. Mm -hmm. it, it's going to be between 24.4 and 26.4 millimeters, or does it mean, is that square still going to be an inch basically? So the smaller, like the larger cuts that you do, the bigger variance it's going to be. Yeah. So I would mm -hmm. say that the little one is probably going to be super close. Um, like right. an inch is going to be like almost spot on, probably within like uh, well under a millimeter. And then when you cut something big, then that might be off by a millimeter as it's moving around okay. with all right. those other variables that we've been talking about. Before. Yeah, I can, I can deal with that. I think most of my inaccuracy now is just a function of basically the sled just doesn't want to fall down. I don't know if it doesn't weigh enough. Um, the the wax that Casey showed earlier, I tried to put, I tried to put some of that on, but uh, I think it's just too cold right now. So I think I actually need to take my sled inside the house and get it warmed up to actually do that. Um, but my sled was definitely talking with some other people is on the lighter end of what they should be. So I've got a few things to try. Um, also, someone mentioned that my vacuum might actually be sucking the sled to the wasteboard, creating extra friction. Um, oh. If like a super high powered shot back? Well, so I took a drink lid and put a put like a half inch hole in the middle because my first few cuts, it was just spraying stuff. Even with the vacuum on, it was just spraying stuff everywhere. Um, so I took a little drink lid and put it over the hole with just a hole enough for the router to come through. But now, you know, there's a lot less outlet for that vacuum pressure. So it's generating more force against this lid. So I kind of need to find a, a happy medium there. That could be, but if it's giving you like a one millimeter variance across the entire and across the entire thing, like you can. Well, so let me let me preface that with my chain calibration was one millimeter. I didn't go and do the corner calibration because um, what I was having last time, if I if I told it to go to the corner and put the put a hole one inch from the corner, this is the corner of the of the board, bottom right. It would be here one time and then here and then here. I mean, off by inches apart. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, for some reason, it, it doesn't want to pull down. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just, I'm right now, I'm staying away from the corners. I'm only cutting in the dead center, but it's going to become a problem sooner or later when I try and cut something big. I added more weight. You did? Yeah. Yeah. So what, you know what yours weighs? Mine was like 23.5, and some people are saying I, 28. I got a little larger bricks, but in order to handle this, this sled, you know, sorry, Drew, this sled is real cheesy. It's kind of thin. If you put a bolt through it, it just, it cracks and rips. So what I did was I cut some plywood, lowered them down a little bit, and then drilled two holes to clamp the brick to it. And you notice they're a little bit farther out there than usual. And I'm able to get actually my bit to go all the way down to here on my, on my unit and, it, and the sled doesn't jump it does it, doesn't it does twist a little bit 
Yeah, but I mean, as long as you're perfectly actual. centered, as long as your your bit's perfectly centered, use a centering jig when you put yeah. it when you tighten it down. Who cares? That's what the bricks are there for. They're well, it's no. slide going to want to turn, but that the bricks bring it back down, right? How That's much? Like, how much weight did you end up adding? So the Just, original bricks I got were like this. I went to Lowe's and got thicker oh, bricks, yeah. and then, like I said, I moved them down probably a half an inch farther out and then down on the okay. on the board itself and I find that actually so instead of mine sitting like this where you know the way it was designed mine's actually sitting like this okay I, I mean I'm an engineer I did some calculations and I found the the center of gravity you I would get more pull just you know enough but yeah, yeah. that's what I found so I moved everything just a nub and it's I don't know. It seems to be working. Seems to be okay. working well. Yeah, I mean, I might, I might consider that. I don't know that I really need to move it out. Weight is weight, but um, I would like the the stronger attachment if I'm gonna go to bigger bricks. And then that would also give me an opportunity to support the um, the the inlet for the vacuum hose is like super easy to pop out. So one of the first things I did was cut a ring that was like fifty thou undersized a C shape and bolt that in there. And so it, it's got some squeeze on the, on the, uh, the elbow. But if I, if I had a, a thing there with bricks on it, I could use the center to support that better. So. So I don't know if, if people realize this, but at the bottom of your, at the bottom of your router, if you look around the bottom, those are the exhaust holes where the, it draws air in from the top of the motor and exhausts it down at the bottom. Um, that little thin area where you hook up the vacuum and it pulls air through and it's supposed to suck that dust in. My router is 10 times more powerful. The air blowing out of the bottom of it, mm. that the vacuum's useless, the little hole in the bottom, it's useless. My, my router blows so much air, it just blasts out. I mean, it's a 2.2 horsepower one. Yeah. Well, well, even with the, even with the DeWalt one, but right down here at the bottom of the motor, that's where all the air, so air comes in the top of the motor here and it exhausts out the bottom. Your, your, Dura, your DeWalt does the same thing. Yeah. So it comes in here, but whenever it exhausts right down here, let me see if you guys can see this. Whenever it exhausts under here, it is the air coming from here to here and blowing out is more powerful than a 650 CFM so what are you system. <laughs> what are you using for dust control right now nothing i mean no. your router your mm -hmm. router in that picture it would take me several hours to get mine that clean again because i have dust all up in every spot now when i put the drink lid over it because the drink lid basically the the shop let the the shop back inlet is below that the drink lid covers the hole i mean i didn't have any no not a spray you know, piece of dust anywhere, but obviously too much suction. So I don't know, I guess I need to reapproach it. I have a different, I have the Bosch, the smaller Bosch router. So I don't know. Uh, I'm assuming that blasts air out the bottom too, but I don't know. Yeah. The, the, I, I don't want to cover up the hole where the router bit is because I like to watch that. I go yeah, over well, and to make sure. So if I cover that, I'm kind of in, in deep doo-doo. So, well, the, uh, yeah, the drink lid's clear, so you. Oh, can, okay. Yeah. You know, I found a I found a perfectly clear one. I've seen I saw on Facebook some people use a piece of plexiglass there to do something similar, and I think there's even a a thing on Thingiverse, because it's a lot of people are are masking that hole to some extent to cut down on dust. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're but I got to be honest with you, the that dust too. that mine produces, it's chip dust. So it's got to be at least 25 microns, if not larger. It falls on the floor. I don't get it all over the place. I do get it on the floor down here along. But, I mean, it's not like my table saw where I get, you know, one to two micron dust and you're breathing it. This thing, though, I mean, it's a CNC whenever the, the bit is chipping large chunks of wood. If you can see it, it's above 30 microns. So it's for me, it's easy to clean up. I just blow it over to, towards the back and... Then I, I use the back, but I got a four I got a four inch shop uh, uh, dust collector, 
And that's what I'm trying to figure out how to hook to this thing because there's the little inlet and everything that's on the bottom of it. It's just not, it's, I don't know. I, I got a design. I, I, I've got to build it yet to see if it works, but it, it needs to plug straight up to a four inch outlet. So we're working on uh, our next like iteration and dust collection is like the big, that is the big thing that we've been working on is like, we have I've been like experimenting with different brackets uh, to like help Velcro a hose onto it and then to cut down on that hole too and have an acrylic um, part on there and, and have an, an upgrade where you can either A, 3D print it or make it yourself or B, get it from us for cheap um, to have like, to narrow down that hole with a clear acrylic and then have an easier uh, way to attach that and stick that hose on there so you're not having to like glue and duct tape and stuff. Like yeah, that. but from an engineering perspective, if you try to close up that hole and stick a vacuum cleaner on it, you've just tripled the resistance. You're literally vacuuming the, the yeah. sled to the to the wood. Down, so yeah. you need something that has less head pressure but more airflow. 600, 600 CFM, something like that. That's the only what would, what would be the possibility of cutting slots in the face of the sled to allow airflow to go right out, you know, between the sled and the workpiece and then into the center hole? You could do that. I, I had experimented with doing like a radial manifold to, you know, but how much engineering do you want to put into that? No. To that? I, I just, what I saw a lot of other, right? yeah. <laughs> a lot of other CNCs do is they have like a, basically a, a soft acrylic curtain that hangs around the bottom. And so I, I took a, another, the other part of my dream, my McDonald's cup, and um, you know, just cut around it with scissors. So it's got like a soft, soft fingers that are vertically oriented. So it just keeps the chip from flying away. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, it, there's no restriction on the top side. The downside is you're, you have to really get that height correct. So your plunge distance is, is protected. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. kind of what I was looking at. This right here fits right down on the inside, and this diameter on this one fits over the top of my over the top of my router. So if I can get this in here and then hook a hose to this side to pull it out, yeah, basically top. then my router is pushing air through the hose out instead of me trying to vacuum it. I'm letting the router do the work. If it's already got a pump X number of CFM through it, I just let that do it. That's what just I'm trying it, to do. It's three dollars. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, this is great. So um, we've got time for like maybe one more question. I see we got um, like Michael just joins. If anybody else has any more questions, everybody doing good. Does anybody have any uh, more final uh, final questions or comments? Or I have one more question, Drew, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Man. Yeah. The new the new version, the new software version, does it have a bit change function in it? So I don't think I haven't seen it. It might. I haven't seen it in there. Um, I don't know if it does yet. Because um, you would need to generate your G code in it to be able to do that. So in the future, we want to be able to have that where you can um, that it, like our pie in the sky vision is that uh, that Makerverse will be also a cam G code generator. Um, so then you can generate the G code in it too, but it doesn't yet. Um, I think it probably has that capability because I know that um, that it, it like the, the steps in the process for having it do G code is there. So I, when it is, then you could program bit changes. But for now, like you were talking about before, you just do either two separate cuts or you have to move it to pause it and then switch the bit. Um, yeah, I, I usually do two separate cuts. Um, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna have to change the G code or add in a bit yeah. stop in the G code. I just wanna be able to say, you know, have click on a button and it says, you know, change bit now. So it would run the cuts, then yeah. go over to home and stop and uh, you know, something would flash and it says change your bit now, something like yeah. that. That's an awesome, I'll put that as like a, as a feature as we're looking at the G code stuff, like uh, that's great. I see a lot of people on Facebook book asking about it as well, but, and people do provide the G code for that, but I don't want to learn how to write every line of G code either. I, yeah, I, I sure. have enough yeah. junk in my head, let alone. That <laughs> and I mean, a lot of those like bigger format CNC machines and stuff like that, you know, the, they're like 15 grand ones and stuff like 
those do have programmable bit changes and all kinds of stuff. And, and they'll even do it like mechanically themselves. Like they'll just yeah. go and switch the bits. Um, so I, that's definitely possible. Uh, so that's something that we actually want to check out. Sure. All right. That's all, all I right, everybody. Well, thanks a lot for joining. Casey, thanks a lot for helping out today, everybody. Uh, it's great. Thanks and, a lot, uh, Wayne, I'll send you an email. Too and uh, and Dave, uh, if you send a message okay. support too, we'll make sure you get you going. Already did. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll, we'll help get you going. Thanks, gentlemen. That was right. awesome. Nice meeting you yeah. guys. Well, take care. See you next week.